All right, well, hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Myth of uh, Seminar and Book Discussion with uh, Nathan Thrall. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present, and future, and also acknowledge that the land has, sovereignty has not been ceded. Today, we are very lucky to have an award-winning author, Nathan Thrall, join us uh, from Jerusalem. Nathan has um, come to Australia as part of the Adelaide Writers' Festival. Um, he's been very busy. If you have followed um, the media, um, he's been on Q&A, um, so many interviews. There was a program on ABC, um, Four Corners, if you happen to see it on Sunday, where Nathan gave an interview and contributed to the discussion on what's going on in Gaza. Uh, the topic of Nathan's work is, of course, very, very topical, very relevant today. Um, Nathan produced his book uh, before the Gaza war. Um, but what he had to say about life of Palestinians under occupation in the West Bank in East Jerusalem uh, is even more pertinent and more relevant. To, um, to, to understand right now. So um, welcome Thank to you. Deakin University, Nathan. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Uh, Nathan is flying out of Austria, out of Melbourne tonight. So we're very happy to have you at the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nathan has, uh, Nathan's book, A Day in the Life of Albert Salama, um, is uh, named as the best book of the year by the New Yorker. Um, the Economist, the, the New Republic, and Financial Times. Um, the book is also selected uh, as um, New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. So um, Nathan is also is, is very much in a perfect position, a very good position to be commenting and writing on the life of Palestinians under occupation and what's going on at the moment in Gaza. Uh, Nathan has served for uh, almost 10 years, I believe, as uh, the, uh, better get the position right, Nathan, Director of Arab-Israeli Project with the International Crisis Group. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to start by asking you the first question. So our format is going to be, I have a few questions to ask. Um, and then I will open the floor to, uh, to your questions. And I will save the Gaza question to last. I know it's probably the most burning question on everyone's mind, but I think we need to set this stage before we get to Gaza. And that's why I'd like to ask uh, Nathan the very first question that is about um, your choice of writing this book yeah. and um, why, basically. Talk about Albert's experience. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the desire to write a book of narrative nonfiction came out of uh, many years working on Israel-Palestine for an international organization uh, called the International Crisis Group, where we did uh, very in-depth on the ground uh, reporting, and this was um, mainly for uh, policymakers to read, politicians and policymakers and uh, other analysts, um, diplomats who were stationed um, in Israel Palestine. And, um, you know, I, I came to feel that, that that work, while it's of historical value to have this record of what's happening, it wasn't very effective in uh, bringing out about any kind of change. And what I repeatedly found when I talked to policymakers is they would say, I'm convinced of what you're saying. This situation is going to continue indefinitely. My own government is uh, supporting it. American officials would tell me this. European officials would tell me this. And we're totally uh, complicit. Uh, in, in, a, in a deeply unjust system, which is going to, to continue uh, uh, so long as we continue to support it. And, um, and so when I would press them and say, you know, what would it really take for you to uh, change your policies, it, it was obvious that um, 
it wasn't even conceivable for them to, mm -hmm. to take the steps that they knew would be necessary to even begin uh, to, to bring about change. So uh, to exert real pressure, to, to um, impose any kind of accountability or consequences on Israel, any measures with teeth, um, those were really out of the question. And, uh, and so I felt that my time would be much better spent not talking to these people and not, mm -hmm. not um, writing for these people, but actually writing for um, a broader audience for the people who are electing these uh, policymakers and politicians. Um, and, uh, and so the desire for the book really, you know, before there was even uh, an idea of what the book would be, there was the belief that I needed to redirect my own mm -hmm. work in life, which was to, to try and talk to ordinary people to help bring about a shift in public opinion yeah. about Israel-Palestine and a greater awareness of, um, of the complicity of governments like the Australian government and, and the US government. Um, and, and so once I had decided on that, then you know there was a, um, there was a choice of what I would, would write about. And what I really didn't want to do was to write about the thing that makes it in the news uh, whenever there uh, is some kind of violence in Israel-Palestine, a war in Gaza, an invasion of uh, Janine. Mm. These kinds of things make headlines, and rightly so. And then the whole world uh, forgets about Israel-Palestine and, and basically is OK with the status quo um, uh, once that, that violence has, has uh, subsided. And, and so the goal of this book was really to draw attention to the situation as it exists um, every day when there's not a war in Gaza, when the war in Gaza is over. Um, because that system of uh, domination by Israelis uh, over Palestinians mm -hmm. um, is, is, not, uh, is not going away. And uh, after we have a ceasefire in Gaza, it will continue to be there. And it will control the lives of Gazans. It will control the lives of uh, Palestinians uh, uh, under Israel's control from the river to the sea. Mm. Thank you. So in the course of uh, researching for the book and um, talking to Abed, I think the the very first question you have to ask is how do you establish trust? How did you, how did you establish that human connection so that um, you could get the story that you wanted? Yeah. So the, the book tells the story of a tragic uh, bus accident involving a group of kindergartners, um, Palestinian kindergartners who lived in the greater Jerusalem area and were on their way to a play area on the outskirts of Ramallah. And the uh, bus was uh, struck by a giant semi-trailer. The, tra the semi-trailer happened to be ferrying uh, stones from a quarry in the West Bank, um, Israel extracting natural resources in the occupied territory, taking them to a, a settlement uh, factory in, in the East Jerusalem uh, settlement industrial zone of Atarot, and, uh, and then using those stones to pave the roads in Israel. The bus flipped over, caught fire, and um, the area in which this accident occurred is in what's known as Area C of the West Bank. So this is the more than 60% of the West Bank that's not, under, not just under full Israeli security control, but under full Israeli administration. So the Palestinian Authority is not allowed to go uh, to the site of this uh, crash to any part of Area C. The Palestinian Authority is relegated to uh, little islands within this uh, 60 plus percent of the West Bank that's designated Area C. The Palestinian Authority is in 165 small uh, islands of semi-autonomy where they're allowed uh, some uh, administration. But even within these areas, Israel enters uh, every day. Um, and so the, the nature of the, of the book, I mean, the ambition of the book was to tell the whole story of Israel-Palestine through the parents and teachers and doctors um, 
and uh, bystanders at the scene of this crash. It was happened on a road that was used mainly by Palestinians. And um, it was more than a half an hour before the first Israeli fire truck came to the site. And I felt that the story of a bunch of Palestinian bystanders coming and rescuing these children from this burning bus and then taking them off in different directions to different hospitals based on the color of the ID that the drivers of these cars had. They had a blue Jerusalem ID. They could enter Jerusalem and go to the superior nearby hospitals there. If they had a green West Bank ID, they had to go in the other direction to the uh, hospital in Ramallah. Uh, and so through that story, I felt like I could explain the entire system of mm -hmm. control. Uh, I could explain Area C, I could explain the annexation of uh, East Jerusalem and uh, surrounding villages, and, uh, and I could explain um, you know, what it is for a Palestinian parent to live in fear of her uh, son being arrested any day in the middle of the night. Soldiers coming at 1.30 in the morning, coming to the door and taking her child, and she doesn't know where he's being taken, and it's over a week before she can even find what detention facility he's in. So when I approached Abed, I was really I was reaching out to everyone I could mm -hmm. who had any kind of connection to the crash, yeah. and um, and Abed, you know, received me at his home in in Anata, and um, I told him what my project was, what my ambition was didn't know that he would be at the center of it at that yeah. point at all. And, um, and he started to tell me, tell me his story. And, um, and you know, when I, I, he came with me on book tour uh, in the US and in the UK. And we did a number of events together. Um, and he was asked this question a lot. Why did you trust this guy? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so his answer was um, that I had tears in my eyes when he first told me the story. We also, after that, spent many, many hours together. You know, we spent better part of the last several years of our lives together. Um, so with him, with, with Abed in particular, it was a really different kind of uh, relationship. I mean, I was, I was spending so much of my time with him, mm -hmm. his time with me. And um, I, I can't explain the trust that he bestowed on me other than, than to just say that's entirely, you know, was his, his choice and to, to his credit. And, and the book benefits immensely uh, from the fact that he, he chose to do that. Fantastic. Well, obviously, there is chemistry and there is a personal connection that makes it possible. The empathy yes. that you showed to um, a victim of yeah. this tragedy. Thank you. Um, often, um, the West Bank is described as the second front of Israel's assault on Gaza. Um, and obviously, as you've described, you have stayed in touch with Albert and your friends. Yeah. So um, how is he and his family faring in the current environment? Yeah. Um, What's the impact on them? It, it's it's uh, been a per terrible period for them and for uh, everyone in the West Bank. Mm. Um, he Abed was, we had planned to get to be together on tour in the U.S. and the U.K. for six weeks, and he um, had to cut that short because the right after October seventh, um, you know, the community that he lives in Anatta, uh, it is surrounded on three sides by a 26-foot tall uh, concrete wall, the separation barrier or the apartheid wall, and on a fourth side by another wall that runs through a segregated road, Route 4370, sometimes called the apartheid road. Uh, and there are about 130,000 people living in this community. Uh, part of it has been formally annexed by Israel. Part of it has not. But if you go in this area, you cannot tell the difference between the annexed, so-called annexed area and the unannexed area. It's all in one state of utter neglect without playgrounds and sidewalks and uh, even a single ATM for 130,000 people uh, in this area. 
and uh, uh, I've lost track of my uh, of, of the question. How Albert and his family are oh, how, coping. How, so, so the, there are two exits mm. to this community. One hundred thirty thousand people with two exits. Mm. So uh, the exit to Jerusalem mm -hmm. is only accessible to those who have a blue ID. Right. Half the people in this area have a blue ID, half have a green ID. Mm. Within the same families, you have members who have blue ID or right. green ID. And, uh, and so what Israel did is it shut down uh, the two exits. So it takes four soldiers to trap 130,000 people. You just move a gate, close another gate, and that's it. And that's how so much of the West Bank is. Yeah. It's, it's very, very easy for Israel to lock people in. Mm. So while, immediately after October 7th, Abed's family was locked in in Anatta. They slowly started to ease those restrictions. Now they're not uh, locked in. But the restrictions on movement throughout the West Bank are greater than they've ever been. They, this is worse even than during the Second Intifada. Um, it takes uh, hours to get from one place to another that used to take the same trip would take, you know, a, a fourth that time or a fifth that time. Um, and uh, everybody's out of uh, work, too. You know, the highest paying jobs are in Israel and the settlements. Yeah. Every extended family depends on those higher income jobs. Mm -hmm. And almost all of those have dried up all but a few thousand of them, Israel has stopped allowing Palestinians to work in, in Israel in the settlements. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so you have, you know, close to 200,000 people who are out of work, who are the backbone of the uh, Palestinian economy. Mm -hmm. These jobs are so valuable that people, even members of the Palestinian security forces, mm -hmm. which is one of the uh, best jobs that you could have, uh, highest paying jobs that you could have uh, mm -hmm. in in the West Bank, some of those people will go on, they have a full-time job, they'll go on the weekend and work as construction okay. workers yeah. in, in Israel Just uh, to earn in, money. on the weekend. So uh, the situation uh, for everyone in the West Bank is, is one of economic uh, strangulation. There's a huge rise in uh, uh, settler violence as well. And, uh, and for those who live in uh, Area C, um, there's a, a, a spike in forced displacement. So prior to October 7th, there had been a record number of Pal Palestinian Bedouin who had been forced uh, from their homes um, in the year and a half prior to uh, October 7th. It was over 1,000 people in this short period. Mm -hmm. And uh, just in the month after October 7th, you had another 1,000 uh, who were forcibly displaced because the whole world was looking somewhere else. And this was an opportunity to push Palestinians off their land and to expand uh, uh, Israeli settler control. Hmm. Um, so, so it is a, a really grim, a grim situation in, in, in the West Bank right now. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned two. I should also mention, sorry, just the, yes. the violence. I mean, that over four hundred Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank since uh, since October seventh. You mentioned um, different color IDs and the access it gives you to different locations, yeah. Jerusalem or Ramallah. On what basis are these um, IDs given? Yeah. How do you secure a green ID? Yeah. So a green ID is given to anybody who lives uh, in, in the West Bank, a Palestinian who lives in the West Bank. And a, a blue ID is for those who uh, live in the parts of the West Bank that Israel formally annexed in 1967. So who live in East Jerusalem or in the more than two dozen surrounding um, uh, villages that were annexed or who, whose lands were partially annexed. Um, and so you have... Uh, uh, communities where, you know, the wall didn't run along mm. the annexation line that Israel drew in 1967. When they, Israel erected the, the separation barrier, 
uh, it chose to route it in such a way not to be, it could have put it just along mm -hmm. the line of what it considers sovereign versus not sovereign Israel, but instead it saw it as an opportunity to push out as many Palestinians as possible, including those who had full Jerusalem residency or paying municipal taxes in Jerusalem, right. to push them out of the center of the city uh, on the other side of the wall. And so a community like the one where the parents and teachers in this book come from has uh, people who are paying municipal taxes to the city of Jerusalem and receiving virtually uh, no services. Mm. Um, yeah. Because they're on the wrong side of the wall. Because? They're on the wrong side of the wall. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, I actually could read a, a short passage from the, the book that uh, describes a little bit of what, what, how the system, system works. By all means, please. Sure. So this, um, this passage um, uh, is uh, near the end of the rescue of the children uh, from the bus. And the um, main person mentioned is, is uh, uh, Huda Dahbur, who is a um, doctor and mother and she leads a medical team for the Palestinian UN Refugee Agency, UNRWA. Um, and she just happened to come with her medical team. They were on their way to a field visit somewhere else, and they came upon this burning bus, stopped their van, got out, and, and helped uh, rescue the children. And another person who's mentioned is a man named Salem, who uh, heroically entered this uh, burning bus repeatedly and uh, rescued dozens of, of children. Nearly 20 minutes had passed since Huda and her staff had come upon the burning bus. Flames and smoke were still pouring from the smashed windows. Huda's driver, Abu Faraj, was directing traffic, keeping an open path for the evacuees and telling drivers of on oncoming cars to turn back. The crowd had grown so large that Huda could no longer see the driver and the teacher she and Salem had pulled from the front of the bus. She was focused on the children, gently carrying them with one of the UN nurses to the cars that had stopped at the accident site. Many of the drivers had volunteered to transport the burn victims and stood ready to race to the nearest accessible hospital, which, for most of them, was in Ramallah. The hospitals in Jerusalem were far better, but only those with blue IDs could, could reach them. A few of the drivers did have blue IDs, and some took off in the direction of Hadassah Hospital at Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. The majority, those with green IDs, went in the opposite direction, along the flooded road to Ramallah. Nearly all the children had been brought off the bus when Salem, who had by now gone in and out of the flames several times, saw that Ula, the teacher and his partner in the rescue, was trapped beneath a front seat and her leg was burning. But by the time he got to her, it was too late. She was gone. He carried Ula from the bus and placed her on the ground. Her nephew, Sadi, watched in the rain while a man covered her with his coat. In all of this, Salem had felt nothing, not even as someone in the crowd grabbed at his arm and pinched him. One of Huda's nurses yelled to him that his jacket was on fire. He shouted back that it was not. The nurse put it out as he went to climb back into the bus. The few children still inside were no longer alive. The last boy Salem pulled out was facing down crouched behind the frame of a seat. He was still wearing a backpack, which Salem held to pick the boy up. Stepping out of the bus for the final time, Salem broke out weeping, shouting that he should have saved more. Somehow, not a hair on his head was burned. Abu Faraj stood unmoving, in shock, as if mesmerized by the flames. Huda turned to the nurse beside her and saw that her face was black and streaked by rain. She realized she must look the same. They were soaked and bone-weary, and there was nothing more for them to do. When a Palestinian ambulance finally arrived, most of the injured children had already been evacuated. Huda didn't even notice it. The bus was still crackling with flames, and there was much shouting and commotion. Not a single firefighter, police officer, or soldier had come. Huda wanted to follow the children. She found her team, and they returned to the UNRWA van. Nida, the pregnant pharmacist, was still inside, inconsolable. 
Abu Faraj started dropping off everyone at home as Huda called around and confirmed that most of the children were in Ramallah. Then she phoned her UNRWA supervisor. He didn't understand the magnitude of the accident and demanded that the team turn around and go to Khan al Ahmar, or he would cut their pay. Huda refused and said he should cut just her salary, no one else's. After stopping for a quick shower, Huda set off for the hospital, taking the clinic's social worker with her. When they got there, word spread that Huda had been at the crash. A great many parents and other relatives sought her out, asking whether she had seen a boy with a Spider-Man backpack, a girl with her hair and yellow ribbons. Huda told them all the same thing. The children had been covered in soot, and she couldn't tell what they were wearing. Going from room to room, Huda checked on the injured children, soothing them. Since leaving the bus, she had felt something nagging at her. She was sure the kindergartners had been silent, at least early in their ordeal. Now, at the bed of one girl, Huda asked her what, why that was, why she had heard no sound. We were so scared, the girl said. When we saw the flames, we thought we had died. We thought we were in hell. It's quite moving. Thank you. I think it's probably appropriate to now move to Gaza. Yeah. And uh, ask how you think your book can help us understand what's going on in Gaza. So, I mean, at, at the most uh, uh, basic level, you know, Gaza is treated uh, as an exception. And um, if we look at the way that Israel controls the lives of Palestinians, of the 7 million uh, Palestinians living under Israeli control, it's a variegated uh, system. You have uh, different kinds of restrictions imposed on people in Gaza, different kinds of restrictions posed on Palestinian citizens within Israel's pre-67 borders, different kinds of restrictions imposed on people in uh, uh, annexed East Jerusalem, and different kinds of restrictions within the West Bank, depending on whether you're in Area A or B or C, not to mention, of course, the restrictions imposed on Palestinian refugees who are not even uh, allowed to enter. Um, so, so Gaza, I just want to say, it got the, the, Gaza is different. Uh, all these places are different. But at the most basic level, Gaza is a, is a densely populated Palestinian area. And the Israeli attitude toward a densely populated Palestinian area is it's, we're unable to settle it. We're unable to take it over. There are just too many people there. So we wall it off. We wall it off and, uh, and um, make it very difficult for those people to mm -hmm. move. And the uh, restrictions on Gaza are uh, like the restrictions that you have in a community like mm -hmm. uh, Anatta, where the people in this book live. They're also living in a walled off uh, ghetto with severe restrictions on their movement. And, um, and the logic between behind walling off Anatta and walling off Gaza is very similar. Uh, when they were creating the wall, mm -hmm. they chose to route it in a, such a way as to push as many Palestinians on as little land uh, without relinquishing uh, land. So the most Palestinians that you can push over without giving up too much land, that's the, the overriding logic. Mm -hmm. and, and often we're, when we talk about Gaza, it's said you know, that there's been a siege um, for the last uh, 17 years, which is true. But the restrictions that were imposed on Gaza long precede Hamas's takeover. Those go back to uh, the early 90s. And the first fence went up around Gaza in the early 90s. And the permit restrictions and the, you know, uh, the greater uh, uh, restrictions on, on, on freedom of movement for Palestinians in Gaza uh, is something that long uh, precedes uh, Hamas's uh, control. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think it is uh, now a good time to open the floor to 
questions? If there are any? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, if you were to look in the future, how do you see the current four data ending? Um, I, th I think that in many ways, um, we're already nearing, from the Israeli perspective, the end of their intensive uh, military campaign. I think there's a question of whether they're going to um, uh, invade Rafa and do everything that they had done uh, in, in, this, in the north of Gaza and in Khan Yunus uh, in, in Rafa. But basically, most of the reservists uh, are, almost all the reservists are, have been called back home. Uh, the footprint, the military footprint in Gaza is much, much smaller for, in terms of Israeli troops than uh, it had been. And so I see a possibility that we just don't have a definitive end to the war, that, th that you know, Israel will continue to be in a, a buffer area in Gaza, it will continue to go in at will and do bombings or raids. Uh, they've created a giant road uh, cutting Gaza in half, the north from the south now. And, uh, and so I think that what we see at present could last a very long time without it being, um, without there being some clear end, uh, end to the war. Uh, it's also possible that there can be an end declared, and we see much of what we're seeing uh, now. So the war is over, but now Israel is um, continuing to do operations in Gaza and continuing to control Gaza. What I think is very unlikely are any of the plans that have been put forward about um, about uh, having a multinational force uh, or having um, Arab states contribute troops. Um, there are lots of very fanciful plans about what would happen, so-called day after plans in Gaza. And I don't think any of those are um, likely to, to happen. I think that the basic option is uh, continued Israeli occupation. Uh, or more or less Hamas control uh, with either a fig leaf uh, in front of the Hamas control or not. But you, know, you could have a technocratic government that's the face of, of, of the administration to the world. But um, none of this is eradicating Hamas. I mean, Hamas is going to be in Gaza whether the invasion of Rafa happens or it doesn't. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see um, this whole notion of the PA coming and taking control. I don't think that's uh, feasible either. So um, there's a separate question of whether Palestinians will unify and whether Hamas will be brought into the PLO and whether that can be a stepping stone to having some kind of new political future. But leaving that aside, the basic options are Hamas control with or without a fig leaf and Israeli uh, occupation. And you can have a kind of a mixture of those two things. I mean, now in the north, you have Hamas reemerging to help distribute and what little aid is there uh, in an area that Israel claimed was totally cleared of Hamas and they had declared mission accomplished. So that will be the case everywhere in Gaza when Israel pulls back. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, first of all, congratulations to your book. Your book Thank you. Um, my question, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but my question, first and foremost, is how did you cope? How did you emotionally cope living where you live with the situation as a whole? So let me just repeat the question, sure. if you don't mind, Nathan. Yeah. So there's a question about how um, you personally cope living in such harsh environments. 
So, I mean, the, the truth is that it's a very easy environment for me. I mean, who has to cope? Are people living in Gaza, people living in Anatta, people who are walled off and deprived of, of, of rights? Uh, I'm there as with an American passport, living as a journalist, able to go more or less where I want. Um, and uh, yeah. I haven't yet. I really want to. Um, so it's more the fact that you know being part of the of of the political system that is the occupying force. Yeah. You know that's the difficulty of coping, isn't it? Yes. So so it's hard for me, you know, to answer th th that question because I'm I don't consider myself a part of the regime in Israel. I'm really an outsider to, I'm not an Israeli. Um, and, um, and so I'm, you know, I'm an outsider there. I'm not a Palestinian. I'm not an Israeli. Um, and, and I think that the issue of, you know, complicity and asking about how do Israelis feel about their own uh, complicity in the system, I think most Israelis really do not feel uh, all that uh, bad about it. I think that there's a lot of uh, ideology that, um, that, that they've imbibed from a young age, which is we have no choice. This, that's like the leading slogan in Israel, Enbrira, no choice. So that we have no choice but to control Palestinians indefinitely. Uh, if we were to give them a state, they would attack us from it, and so, uh, and we can't give them citizenship and equal rights because then we won't be a Jewish state. So this is our only choice. And once you've told yourself that, then everything is justified. If you don't mind, thank you so much. Um, we've got a question from Shadi who said, when you present your book to various audiences, I imagine that you share realities that come as shocking to various audiences while it is a reality for people living in Palestine. How do you, how does that make, is it a bed or a bead and yourself feel? Um, can you repeat the question? Sorry, how does it make me and, and, and Abed feel? Uh, which, what's the first part? So when you present your book to various audiences, yeah. I imagine that you share realities that come as shocking to various audiences while it is a reality for people living in Palestine. How does that make you feel? Hmm. Well, I, th I think if, if it's shocking to an audience, that's a good start. Uh, it should be shocking. Uh, it, is, it is shocking. It's, 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 a, it's a horrific reality. And the reason it's continued for so long is not enough people are shocked by it. So if I come and I see that people are shocked, I think that's a, that's a, great, a great start. Got another question from Brian who has two questions. One, I often hear supporters of Israel using Arab citizens in Israel as a defense to deny Israeli atrocities and existing systematic discrimination. What are your thoughts on this? So, as I mentioned, you know, that um, under Israel's control, there are seven million uh, Jews and seven million Palestinians, and uh, and those Palestinians, the vast majority of them, don't have basic civil rights, um, and and nowhere uh, in this area under Israel's control do Jews and Palestinians have equal rights. Uh, however, Palestinians do have varying degrees of uh, restrictions or rights uh, depending on their status. And so the ones who, if you look at this hierarchy of being a refugee is the worst possible thing, and you can't even enter, being a Gazan trapped uh, in this uh, little enclave and unable to exit, is the second worst. And then, you know, being a, a West Banker uh, in Area C maybe is, is the uh, 
third worst, and then a, being a West Banker in area B or A, and then a Jerusalemite, and then the best of these is to be a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Um, of course, Israel will try and point to the Palestinian citizens and say, um, well, we had one who was on the Supreme Court, we have another who's a head of a hospital, um, and so forth. But, you know, the Palestinian citizens, um, first of all, many of them are internally displaced. They're unable uh, to go even to their home uh, villages that they came from prior to 48. They make up about 20% of the uh, population, and they're constricted to about 2 to 3% of the land. And, um, uh, you know, they don't have equality. Go to Brian's second question. Do you think the ordinary people of Israel should be held responsible for the atrocities of their government? Considering that Israel is a democracy, plus the ordinary people are also indirectly benefiting on the current policies. I mean, of course, Israel's a democracy and uh, the uh, policies are being implemented by a democratic government and, and um, that's why it's entirely uh, legitimate that there should be, you know, sanctions imposed on, uh, on Israel. Why is it the politicians in the US will not even consider a change in policy towards Israel? Is it just the Israel lobby or something else? It makes little sense when they could lose many votes to, despite campaign funding by the Israel lobby. So I think, uh, of course, the uh, pro-Israel groups in the, in the United States and lobbying groups like, like APAC are um, uh, very powerful and have a lot to do with um, the, why American policy is the way that it is. There are other factors as well. Um, and um, one part of the question, maybe I misunderstood, it, it seemed to imply that there's um, a price to be paid in terms of loss of votes for being so pro-Israel. And that, unfortunately, is not the case. Um, so in fact, you have all of these pressures in one direction, but almost no price to be paid for uh, being very uh, pro-Israel, even if you as a politician don't, don't actually believe in it. Um, and what is unique today is for the first time, we have this mass mobilization around Gaza, and there's talk of potentially, you know, Biden could maybe lose an election uh, uh, because uh, young people and many of the people who vote for the uh, Democratic Party are uh, appalled by what the US uh, is doing, what the Biden administration is doing. So if that happens, that could start to change. Um, that could start to change the the politics in the United States, and that's why some people think it's it's a price they're willing to pay to to have Trump uh, come into office. If that's really going to be what it takes to show uh, that actually no, you you cannot um, uh, side with with Israel at every uh, turn and be complicit in this uh, slaughter, then um, then a lot of people think that's that's a price worth paying. Thanks, Nathan. So I haven't read your book, but I've read the essay from New York Review. Two elements of that are super interesting that I think then relate to what's happening now. It's like the sort of, I guess, the policy, the historic policies of displacement um, that go way back um, to, the, to the beginning. Um, and then also I think it's related, it's this very malicious but quite ingenious use of the law to disenfranchise people and to create also those situations um, that lead to displacement. So thinking here about the ID cards that you mentioned so well, the case, the trash collection, the roads, all these things um, are kind of push factors that make people want to leave. Obviously in Gaza now we have massive military campaign, but that is now just the most recent iteration of a bunch of policies designed to make people want to leave, basically, right? Yep. Um, 
and I guess the question, I'd love to hear your thoughts and I think, you know, in all your work from many years at the crisis group, but even now when I hear you speak now, you, you is it something I very much admire about you, you're so good at dancing around what your kind of opinions are, I think, uh, in all of this. And so I guess I try to push you a little bit, I guess, on what your thoughts are in terms of Israeli policy. Um, and I, I know you do that for good reason, and I know you did it for good reason at the crisis group, but I guess I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about whether you think that is deliberate Israeli policy in Gaza in terms of the displacement of the population um, elsewhere. I mean, we hear of thousands yeah. leaving, and then also whether that will equate to similarly in the West Bank that you've mentioned already in just briefly in the talk. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and currently happening more. Mm. Yes, yes. Thanks. Um, so, you know, as you know, the idea of transfer, as it's uh, called in Zionist discourse of pushing Palestinians out, is something that has been there from the very inception. You go back to Herzl's diaries, and he talks about uh, uh, spiriting the, the penniless um, uh, local population across the borders. Um, so, so this is a very old theme, and it's a very old uh, uh, problem for Israel. You know, we had a project of creating a Jewish state against the will of the native majority, and how do you do that? And so, um, so I think that more or less Israel does not have an actual realistic plan for what to do with, with the Palestinians. I think that they would love to wake up in the morning and discover that they'd all left. They like the idea of um, making conditions so miserable that there will be a kind of natural exodus. Um, but I think that at present, um, despite having these very right-wing pro-transfer members of the current government, it's still the case that the balance of power within uh, Israeli politics is, is such that um, no one thinks that it's really possible to forcibly uh, transfer uh, Palestinians to force force them out of the, the West Bank and to force them out of Gaza. There was talk with this war now in Gaza of not just right wing, but center uh, centrist politicians talking about so-called voluntary transfer. So paying Palestinians to leave to other countries, uh, paying Gazans to leave. But I think they've found that that too is, is totally uh, unrealistic. And despite all of this talk of, of you know, pushing Palestinians out and pushing people out of Gaza, um, the reality is there are many, many Gazans who want to leave, who are in living in the most terrible circumstances right now um, and cannot. And, and I have a, a dear friend and uh, colleague who uh, I have been trying to help get out for months and it was impossible. And over and over again, the answer was the Israeli government was the one that wasn't allowing uh, him out and his family out. Um, so so um, I think that Israel realizes that it would jeopardize its peace treaty with Egypt uh, if it were to push uh, Gazans into Egypt. And, and I think that they still believe, despite, despite what we see now, that they that that we can have this level of killing, this level of horror from much of the world. Uh, you know, one lesson that they could draw from that is there's a lot more we can get away with. Um, but I think that at present, most uh, most of the Israeli uh, center doesn't believe that it's really possible. And so they're stuck in this internal debate about what do we do and what's realistic. And, and basically, the, the, the main thing that they plan to do is just to continue the situation indefinitely. We're not going to give them rights. 
we're not going to expel them, uh, and and we're not going to give them a state, and we're and we're just going to hope that somehow the situation changes. Maybe there will be a giant war. Maybe there will be uh, a lot of population movement when a war happens. Maybe that will be an opportunity for those on the far right to carry out uh, uh, expulsions. Uh, but at present, they, they basically they have no, no answer other than we've lived for over half a century without giving them rights, without giving them a state. And we can continue. Um, if you don't mind keeping it brief, because we need to wrap up. So there's a mic there. Thanks. Um, so I, I'm interested to know how much um, Israelis know about the situation um, in um, in West Bank in, in Gaza prior to October 7, and also um, about the Nakba. Yeah. I hear that uh, it's not it's forbidden to teach it in schools. And related to that, we'll bring you your book. <laughs> um, so so I think that it's it's there's not a um, there's not a, a very uh, short way to answer that the first part of the question. On one hand, you know, Israelis do a mandatory service in the army. Most of what the army is doing is running the, the occupation. And so all of these Israelis have not just seen it, but participated in it, have run the checkpoints, have gone into people's homes in the middle of the night, have taken children. You know, they they're, they're, have experienced it themselves. Um, but on the other hand, you know, once those two years are up, or if your child isn't coming home every Friday from his or her military service and telling you the story of what what they're doing, you're, most Israelis are able to totally tune it out. So you can live in the center of uh, Tel Aviv or any of the surrounding areas, the area known as Gush Dan, and and you know barely encounter. Palestinians or occupation or think about it um, and and so I think that that um, Israelis have an awareness but also but it's not a day-to-day -day awareness they're not confronted with it there are other areas where you can live if you're a settler you're you, you're much more confronted with it and even there they do all kinds of things to make it them feel as though they're not living in the middle of a, a Palestinian area, so that they will have a by, so-called bypass roads, these highways that you know cut through or around Palestinian villages, where you don't have an entrance from the village onto the highway, and the settlers can just go from their homes to their government offices or high-tech companies or whatever, and they just feel like they're on a highway in any suburb of any city. Um, so the, 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 I think that the longevity of this system has a lot to do with how many Israelis, how the majority of Israelis are able to live their lives as though they're in a normal country and as though they aren't uh, subjugating uh, millions of people who are deprived of basic rights. That awareness is, is, is not there for most people uh, day in and day out. And in terms of awareness of the Nakba, I think that there is awareness that Palestinians uh, say that they were ethnically cleansed. Um, and I think that they're, you know, the mainstream view is, is of course, that um, it, it's it's filled with 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 nonsense, but the mainstream view is you know we we were attacked, uh, we declared independence, we were attacked by uh, a bunch of Arab states who came and invaded, who couldn't abide by the uh, the idea of a, of a Jewish state. Uh, miraculously, though we were greatly outnumbered, we defeated them, and many of their own leaders called on the Palestinians to. 
uh, leave. And because they're a hostile population, we didn't allow them to come back. Of course, who would? And that's kind of the, the narrative. And of course, that's wrong at every step of what I just said. Um, you know, something like 300,000 of the Palestinian uh, refugees from uh, 48 were actually uh, already refugees prior to Israel's declaration of, of independence, prior to the uh, beginning of what many people call the beginning of the, the um, uh, 1948 war. In fact, it was a massive civil war from the end of November 1947 until May 1948. And hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were displaced then. Um, and they don't have any excuse about preventing the Palestinians from uh, returning, I mean, after the war was over. Whatever the truth is of the war, and by the way, there are Israeli military intelligence reports from the Israeli army, their own military intelligence assessment, which you can find right now online, Google it, uh, from June 1948 that estimates how many um, uh, Palestinians were, it, 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 it describes the percentages of all the different ways that Palestinians were displaced, how they were displaced, what percentage were forced to, to flee, what percentage were uh, expelled, what ex percentage ran because a neighboring village was attacked and they were frightened for their lives, what percentage they estimate were indeed told by their own leaders, you know, go and just come back uh, when the fighting's over. And uh, the, the Israel's own assessment is that most were forced to flee. Uh, and that very few uh, fall under this category, which is the main one of the main Zionist talking point. Um, so anyway, the, it, it's it's a it, it's a history that's false, but but it, it's widely held. It's widely believed. So, please. oh, the, I, I hope that it will be translated into Hebrew. It hasn't been uh, yet, and you know I think that there is a real reluctance by Israeli publishers to take it on. Um, I hope we find a brave one who does, but so far, no luck. So that question brings us full circle to the book again. Thanks for that. And I do, I uh, would like to remind you that we have the book uh, for sale and uh, Nathan has kindly agreed to sign the book. So you have your own uh, autographed copy of, uh, of the book. Well, thanks so much, Nathan. Thank you for, for having me. Wonderful conversation. Um, quite moving, quite sad, but very important topic to cover. Thank you. Thanks for joining Thank us. You, Thank, Thank you for coming. And have a safe trip back home. Thank you. Tonight. Thank